Welcome back to another edition of Jen Sports Corner. Back at you for August 9th, 2022. I am Jen. This is my co-host. Brian from Ryan Sports Kiss. What's up, Joe? I mean, so today we're going to go into, hey, you see the hat right now. You know what time it is. We on Eagles time, man. Fly birds fly. Fly equals fly. Whatever you're feeling today, man. Um, so we're going to talk about training camp, especially Sunday's practice at the link, the open practice, the highlights, the lowlights, some of the good things we saw, some of the things that we're concerned about. And then we're going to talk about some of the keys to a successful season this year for the Eagles coming up, so what the additions they made and how they're going to impact the team. So without further ado, let's go into Sunday's practice. You know, a lot of anticipation. You know, A.J. Brown was obviously excited. He, he, I don't think he expected to see 30,000 fans for a fucking practice, but this is Philadelphia, man. It's how so, we That's what we do, bro. <laughs> Football season, man. Yeah. I mean, we're a passionate fan base, so when you come out, you know, he didn't know what to expect, you know, coming from Tennessee. So you're the Philly now. It's, uh, you're going to get a whole nother level of uh, passion. Exactly, exactly. So let me what, – what do you think about Jalen Hurts and the things that you saw in the 11-on-11 uh, drills on Sunday? Um, I didn't see all of it, but I heard he did a lot of running. Um, I – I did see some of the passes he made. Um, I noticed his um, his uh, what you what you call it, his uh, footwork and just his throwing motion just looked a little smoother. Um, he it just you know his accuracy looks like it, it's gonna be sharper. Um, but you know I'm we're hoping right, but um, but it, it, he looked pretty good from the the things I saw. And um, just, uh, you know, with A.J. Brown, I think A.J. Brown and his chemistry is going to be smooth. You know, and I think that's only going to open a lot of things up for Devontae. And it's – I think he's going to take off this year, man. It's going to open a lot of things up for that offense. But I'll tell you what, adding A.J. Brown to this offense was one of the best things Howie Roseman has done for this team, period, in my opinion. In a long time. Not only yeah. did he get, get a – a top tier receiver, but you're getting him going into his prime. I wouldn't even say this is his prime yet. He's 24. He just turned 25, I think. Yeah, um, he turned 25. Uh, the same, okay. same difference. I mean, he's he's already yeah. made a splash in the NFL. He's only going to get better. And the things that we like to do play into his strengths. You like the RPO game. You like running the read option. You want to hit guys on those quick hitter slants. Mm-hmm. He plucks the ball out the hit, the air very well. He's a hands first type of catcher. He breaks tackles, and then if you don't wrap up with both hands, he's going to take a seven yard slant, sixty four yards to the house. That's what he yeah. does. Yeah, he's a big boy, and you know when you got yeah. a big receiver like that who can out muscle, you know the cornerbacks. I mean, he's he's, he's going to be a big play boy. I tell you, I, I just. Uh, the placement of that ball on that Sunday in practice, man, like you can't throw any more perfect than that. That was just ridiculous. That pass was ridiculous in my opinion. Yeah. And I, I like the, the improved accuracy. We'll, we're going to see what degree is improved as you get into the preseason games and helmets are flying and they're not necessarily trying to not hit you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So to your point, and you, you mentioned it, we saw a lot of running around from Jalen Hurts, even in the seven on seven drills, which are designed to be pass first drills, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to see his pocket presses. Where is that? Is it improved? At the very least, at the very worst, I would hope it stayed the same. At the very best, it needs to improve. Yeah, absolutely. For, for, for him to really capitalize on the amount of weapons he has around him. Mm-hmm. Because he had the the uh, longest from snap to release time on his throws in the NFL. Part, yeah. part of that is due to the fact that our O-line was just a titanium wall. They they gave him all the time in the world to be able to throw, so he's extending plays. He's sitting back there scrambling around, thinking about what he had for lunch, thinking about what he's going to lift, you know, the next day after practice. Like, you know, he has too much time back there. But oh, with that being said, he would be so much more efficient if he was able to read the field. Um. So one thing I noticed with Jalen Hurts is drops back, goes to his first read, comes back across the field, but he won't circle back 
the other way with his head. Once he goes left to right or right to left, he, he won't scan back and look for his third and fourth options. Once he once he gets to his third option, he won't – well, excuse me. Once once he goes from his hot receiver, looks to his third, second and third options, he will not go back to his hot receiver. He's just going to take that snapshot and then run if he doesn't see what he wants at, with that first go through. And that's right. something that he has to work on. Because yeah. let's say it's a play – a route combination. You have one side of the field. You have um, Devontae Smith flanked outside. You have Quez Watkins in the middle. You have, let's say you have um, a concept where you have um, Devontae Smith going straight, running vertical. You have Miles Sanders coming out the backfield, putting pressure on the flat. And then you have Quez Watkins taking an intermediate route and putting pressure on that part of the field at the intermediate part. With teams, yeah. teams have seen the Eagles do that a lot. And and part of what Tampa did in that playoff game, they knew once we we um shut down it's not a mesh concept. I forgot what concept it is, but once we I think it's a cell concept. Once we shut down that cell concept on the side that he's looking to, that's that's mm-hmm. flooded, we know that he's not going to look back to the left side to a route that may be developing. It might be a route with A.J. Brown on the other side where he runs up and does it in. But they knew that once he kind of, like, gets confused about what we've taken away on this side with the sale concept, we know he's not going to look back left. So they just vacated the middle of the field and just just took away the hash marks. So he's going to have to work on that because if – Absolutely. You know what I mean? Teams are seeing that. hmm And they're, they're not going to stop doing that until he gives them reason to do otherwise. Yeah, he knows he needs to go through his reads correctly because it's like you said, that's some that's teams are gonna study that in the film and they're gonna be like easy he, <laughs> easily figured out. So it's you know what are you gonna do, Jalen? You know, right? And like I said, I, I'm gonna preface back to that Bucks game. There were a few plays, and one that stood out in particular. It was a play to the sideline. They ran a sail. They had trips on the left side, and they ran a, ran a sail concept. And Dallas Goddard, it, it was one where Dallas Goddard went up for the ball and it was outside of his reach. It's because they flooded the that side of the field with like four defenders to account for the three three wide outs. Well, two wide outs and tight end on that side. So they 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 completely took that away and they they I'm not exaggerating, they vacated the middle of the field. Like they mm-hmm. they they sold out to the sidelines. They were that confident <laughs> that Jalen Hurts, once he got three seconds into the play and made his read on the left side, he would not have the wherewithal to look back to a, a streaking Chris Watson, Chris Watkins on that play. He ran up and ran in. And if Jalen Watkins had, I mean, if Jalen Hurts had turned back and scared back towards the middle of the field, he would have seen Chris Watkins about to break open and had an easy 15 yard gains instead of scrambling out panicking and then throwing an incomplete pass slightly out of reach of Dallas Goddard. Like those and and there was a consistent theme throughout that game that the Bucks had had seen on film, and they looked at that as a weakness to exploit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's it's gonna like I said, man, it's a big problem. But so, so we saw that with Michael Vick, right? Michael Vick did not study the playbook, and you know I'm not trying to throw shots at Kyler Murray, but he. In his press conference, he said that, come on now, I wouldn't have gotten to this point if I didn't take the game seriously and study. But you have to wonder why the Cardinals put that clause into his contract originally and then circle back to he had a great season, but that playoff game, you thought Jalen Hurts was bad with the things I just mentioned. We, You remember Kyler Murray's game. It was mm-hmm. worse than Jalen Hurts' game. And he's been in play for more years, for a couple mm-hmm. more years than Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I mean that that was a big uh that was a big risk on signing Calamari after that playoff game. But um I mean he like we all know, I mean Kyler is obviously a better player. Maybe it was just you know, that playoff game, it was inexperience. So let's see if he learns from that. You know, can he grow from that playoff game and take that next step next year? I mean, we'll see, but if he that goes for both of them, but we didn't hear anything about 
there being a lack of accountability with studying the playbook with Jalen Hurts. But we heard about that with a guy that just got a five-year extension, $200 million plus. Yeah, that's a problem. You Maybe my numbers are wrong, but either way, he, he got a monster extension. Yeah. And that as a clause in his contract. This, oh, that doesn't seem like coincidence after that level of a debacle of a playoff game where he looked thoroughly confused. I understand he's an undersized guy that's running around, but it's a pretty sharp guy. But he looked like he was not prepared for a lot of the different looks that the Rams were throwing at him. Dude, you see the Rams twice a year. You know this team. So, obviously, the Rams prepare for you, but you did not prepare for the Rams. It's not like they surprised you. You've seen Dan Aaron Donald twice already. And they ain't going to get past Aaron Donald if he can't figure that out. <laughs> I mean, Aaron Donald, he retired officially, right? He's not. Nah, he's, he's still playing. Still, he's still playing. He decided to come back. Yeah, he decided to come back. And okay. then you got Bobby Wagner, too, there now. They right. signed Bobby Wagner. <laughs> right. So so back to my point, and it's that the Michael Vicks of the world, possibly the Kyler Murrays of the world, the Lamar Jacksons of the world, the Jalen Hurts of the world, there's a difference between – Pat Mahomes and those guys, not necessarily because he's so much more gifted than them. I think I think they they have great skill sets. I don't think it's a talent thing. I think that no. he under the stewardship of Andy Reid, he is a student of the game. No, whereas, sure. he, at, whereas through lack of effort or just through having to just put more time in those other guys have not taken that step yet. No. Um, some guys, some guys like they put in the effort, but they just it's just going to take them a little more time to ascend to that level. And then some guys, they are very smart, but they just don't give a fuck. Like a Mike Mike Vick was that way. Like mm -hmm. he, he said in an interview with Jim Moore Jr., he said, Mike, um, did you ever read the playbooks that I gave you, you know, to go during like, you know, training camp installations? He's like, Mike. He used to give me the books. I used to just put them in the backseat of my car, man. I didn't even read them. Because <laughs> he could just go out and just be Michael Vick. But it's just like, yeah. if he actually put in the effort, he might you might be talking about one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Because you saw you saw what a post Levensworth Michael Vick could do under Andy Reid with one season. Yeah, Imagine he if he had put like half the effort in when he was like 21, 22. That dude was ridiculous. Same thing with Randall Cunningham. I mean, we just go down, go down the list. Randall Cunningham, it wasn't for a lack of want. It was just because the coaching staff he was under, they didn't prioritize it. Buddy Ryan pretty much said, hey, we got the defense. Randall, you're fast as hell. Just go out and make five big plays a game. We'll win. He didn't even put any, any credence into wanting to get a competent offensive coordinator, man. And you saw – as great as Randall Cunningham was in those playoff games, they could never do anything. But fast forward to 1998 when Randall Cunningham is 37 years old, coming off the bench as a backup for a hurt Brad Johnson for the Vikings, comes out, you know, and and he knew the playbook. He was ready when he came in. He 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 stewarded one of the best offenses of all time. And that's him without legs, right? So imagine if Jalen Hurts, I'm doing this to circle back you know, full circle, if he's able, he's putting in the effort, if given the time, if he has a solid year this year and you see enough in him where they would have continue, continue forward and he's focused, I would be very interested to see him and Nick Sirianni grow together and him get to a point where it's him, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, they're all like 28, 29 years old, and now they just built this three-headed monster three years from now that is just going to be wreaking havoc that is that's what i'm hopeful for i don't yeah. need to see him turn into steve young or pat mahomes overnight but i need to see that okay if if it takes him two years but i think he's going to get there fine but if i see if i see the glimpses there and i know i know that the work if he's putting in consistently and i see him just starting to make that turn i might keep him mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's that's what I'm looking for this year. I don't need to see him be an all-pro quarterback, but I do need to see some tangible improvement. Yeah, this is a step up. 
you know, then we need to see a step up from from what he was last year. You know, some um, better footwork, um, better accuracy, which he has, which I have seen in some of the practices that I've watched, and you know, stuff like that. You know, we have to see that. You know, for him to make sure that he, like you said, make sure he's going up. You know, and make that improvement step because guess what? Like you said, it can take him a couple of years. I'm okay with that. You know, as long as he makes that a little bit of improvement this year, we, he can take it up even more next year. You know, whatever. But just keep keep right. going up and we'll be all right, you know? Right. So, you know, that's what's going on with Jalen Hurts. We don't really need to say much about A.J. Brown other than what what a hell of a catch against James Bradbury, who's been having an excellent camp himself. So that says a lot to me. James Bradbury been – giving Devontae Smith that work, really sharpening metal on metal, you know, sharpening the sword. And to get that contested catch over him, a nicely thrown ball, by the way, um, it's, it's what we expect, hope for out of him and what we expect out of him. Yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was an unbelievable throw and no surprise that A.J. Brown can bring that in, you know. But, you know, I don't think Jalen Hurts could have put it in any better spot, truthfully. No, no. That was a very good throw. And, um, yeah, I like what I saw of them. So, I mean, overall, you know, the defense has been the story of training camp. They've been dominant. They've been, you know, I, I think they've, they've been playing at a high level. So, I don't – I'm not getting freaked out that the Eagles offense has been having their up and down days against them because I think they're very, very good. And case in point, we don't even know if Nicobe Dean is going to be a starter at middle linebacker come opening day because TJ Edwards and Kaiser White have been playing so well <laughs> that mm. they cannot strip away first team reps from them. So that's that's extremely encouraging to me. Well, I mean, that, that's pretty big when you can say TJ Edwards is playing a step over Nicobe Dean because then you got hit. I mean, not only if TJ Edwards got down, you got a reliable backup in Nicobe Dean. So the fact that you have that strong of depth, you know, that's huge, you know. Exactly, exactly. Very, very encouraging. They're going to have a lot of – and that depth is going to really help them as they transform from 4-3 to 3-4 when they switch back and forth throughout the course of a game. Like sometimes they'll have like a 4-3 over front, 4-3 under front. They'll have a 3-4. You know, you can mix and match it because – You'll have two starting middle linebackers in Kaiser White and TJ Edwards. And then hell, you 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 can mismatch them at times. You can have Nicobe Dean and, and TJ Edwards a middle linebacker, Kaiser White covering a tight end, and then Hassan Reddick as another pass rusher. Because mm-hmm. Nicobe Dean, along with being a, a pretty solid rookie, he's he was one of the best blitzer, blitzing linebackers in all college football. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, looping in through the A gap, he was phenomenal because we didn't see him run the 40, but he looks like he has possibly sub four or five speed. So he's flying, man. And you have a guy screaming at up the A gap. You can run different stunts. You know what I mean? You have Hassan Reddick and him running games, running stunts. And then if you had then you can have like Fletcher Cox at defensive end. Like they have so many different options, man. Yeah. And then a bull, a big ass bull up the middle with Jordan Davis is probably gonna be ridiculous. There was a highlight. I don't know if it was um, uh, Cam, oh, Cam Jurgens. I think it was Cam Jurgens. He he pushed Cam Jurgens into the backfield so quickly yesterday. It was like he was pushing. That's who that was. I saw that video clip. Yeah. I, was, I didn't know who it was. It was Cam Johnson. I, I didn't remember who it was at first. It was Cam Johnson, I think. It, either him or Landon Dickerson, one of them two. And and he he had him. He was, it's like he like his feet were on skates. He could not hold his ground. And that's just him bull rushing. That's no special effects, straight up and down, just pure physical strength. And that that's, that's a testament to Cam Jurgens for holding his ground, but it just shows you how impactful I think Jordan Davis is going to be, just even as a rookie, even as he doesn't even scratch the surface of his potential, he's going to be an impact player day one. Oh, yeah. I, th- I think he's showing right now that he could have been a top five pick, in my opinion. Just by the way he's, you know, all the shit I'm hearing, how well he's playing. Oh, yeah. So (laughs) that's encouraging to me. I'm so happy with the way that it's like he heard me. Either he heard me or he heard that one kid that has the podcast. He was 
at the NFL draft. I think he was talking to Rich Eisen and he was, remember that kid? He was like, there's like blah, blah, blah. He was like, Howie, for the love of God, please draft a linebacker. Right. Like he he obviously heard one of us because my my picks for our two first round guys, even though it didn't pan out their way, was Devin Lloyd. I wanted him even more than Nicole Dean, but even one of those guys, it was mm-hmm. it I had two and seven. So it was I wanted Jordan Davis with the first first round pick, which they got. And then with that second, second round, second first round pick, if they hadn't traded down, I was hoping they would have got Devin Lloyd out of Utah. Mm-hmm. But even better, they were able to trade down, get a possible center of the future in Cam Jurgens, and then still get Nicobe Dean. That's... So they did everything that I wanted in that draft and more. Yeah. It's a, it's a testament to Howie Roseman for finally being able to figure it out, you know, and will he be able to figure this out going forward as well in other drafts? I guess we'll see. Exactly. I think he will. I mean, he's had a, a good, solid past two drafts. You know, the Devontae Smith one, he, he cleaned up for the uh, – the C.D. Lamb and the Je- uh, Justin Jefferson fiascos, and then this year he he doubled down and finally uh, went out and got a linebacker, um, a real linebacker, yeah, not just a guy that was that was there in the third round because he had one or two things wrong with him. No, only reason that Nicobe Dean slipped down because they had uh, concerns about his pectoral injury, which he he checked out. He cleared that in the offseason. Mm-hmm. But short of that, without that injury. You're talking about a top 20 pick, top 15 pick. Mm-hmm. He's best best linebacker in football, him and Devin Lloyd. Yeah, they him they were the best two linebackers in the draft. So, so now you, gotta, you, got, you went you out know. and got the heart of that Georgia defense. I don't know if you could have asked for more. And then on top of that, you go out and say, damn, we lost Steven Nelson. Who are we going to get? We get James Bradbury, who's in a clear upgrade. And he's going to give you peace of mind on the outside between him and big play slay. Man, I'll tell you what, man, this team, it's just so exciting. I'll be so disappointed if we have a bad year because this, <laughs> this team is so stacked. I just don't see how it could even be possible we have a bad year. And we have a very favorable schedule. Right, right. That's the other thing. I'm glad you brought that up. Our strength of schedule is either, I think it's the second easiest in the NFL. Yeah. Somewhere in that ballpark. Yeah, it's pretty close to that. Yeah, so I think they have a lot of depth. So even if they get injuries, I think they're going to be well equipped to be able to power through them. Yeah, I didn't realize TJ Edwards was having that strong of a camp. Glad you brought that up. I wasn't expecting it, but I've been hearing his name. So that's what they were saying. The Kobe Dean, they're saying he hasn't had a bad training camp. It's just been that. He's been good, but T.J. Edwards and Kaiser White have just been making flash plays. So I'm like, bam, say no more. I love it. Yeah, me too, man. Brings a lot of depth to the team and, you know, it just makes me feel that much more comfortable if one of those linebackers go down. We got Nakobe Dean waiting right on the bench. So absolutely cool with that. Yes. So and so let's flip, flip over to the defensive side and talk about this Eagles defensive line and what they've been doing. So I went over a little bit of this in my live stream uh, earlier, but I wanted to focus back on, we talked about Jordan Davis, but I want to focus back on the guys coming back from injury and then the upgrades you made on defense. So, so addition by addition with Brandon Graham, who's not only back off that Achilles tear, but by all accounts looks very good in training camp. And then you brought in Hassan Reddick, through free agency, coming off a very, very good season with the Panthers. I mean, he was a wrecking ball with the Cardinals. And then that Panthers defense, the rest of the team sucked, but that defense was good. And the big reason for it was Son Reddick. Yeah, Son Reddick made a pretty big sack on uh, Jalen Hurts during that season. I remember he landed remember right that. on top of him. I remember that, yeah. 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 He's only going to do more of that against other QBs this year. So yeah. you have, on the outside edge, you have Josh Sweat and Hassan Reddick. And then as your backup DNs, you have Brandon Graham and Kevin and Derek Barnett, which is Brandon Graham is a hell of a backup if that's your backup. I mean, is it be it'd be the same type of scenario as Chris Long. Like Chris Long is a backup, but he's not really a backup, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. You have an embarrassment of riches. You have guys that are, that are clear starters coming off the bench and rotating. 
And then at D-tackle, you have Javon Hargrave, Fletcher Cox, and then Jordan Davis. You are extremely strong and deep up the middle. Pause. <laughs> and then, um, you know, Cox is going to get penetration. You know what I mean? <laughs> what other puns I got? Um, I'll see myself out. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you're, you're real stout up the middle. And then if if your first line of your first line is Hassan Reddick, Josh Sweat, Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargraves. If your backups are Derek Barnett, Brandon Graham, and Jordan Davis, wow, that's that's a that's a murderer's row. It's a murderer's row. That's exactly that's what has me excited. I, what do you, what say you? I totally agree. Just the like, I mean, you pretty much stole the words right out of my mouth. Like that whole entire line, when you have that much depth. On that line, if I'm even saying that right, deaf or dead, whatever. But mm -hmm. when you have that much firepower on the defensive line, that's going to give quarterbacks nightmares. Like, it's just crazy how much – I don't think I've ever seen this Eagles team have so much. It's it's crazy. I mean, Brandon Graham, Hassan Reddick, Jordan Davis, Fletcher Cox, Hargrave. I even forgot about Hargrave. It's, a, it's like we have so much – I forgot we even had those other players. And it's like, and it just makes me that much more excited for his defense and the potential they have for this year. It, it's going to be crazy. And it's going to make the secondary's life that much easier because when you, we all know when you have a good front, it makes the back end's life a hell of a lot easier. Yes. And um, what what makes this draft pick so impactful is that when they decide they have the flexibility and he said he wanted to do this they have the flexibility to switch to a 3-4 front because now you truly have a space eating nose tackle in Jordan Davis who's just going to he's going to be like like Saturn he's going to have moon he's going to have people orbiting around him and just glued to him just by proxy like yeah. just by him being there so imagine if you have him in the middle, Fletcher Cox as one defensive end, which is a nightmare in itself. Hargate, Hargraves or Brandon Graham as the other defensive end, which is a nightmare within itself. And then on the edge at outside linebacker, you have Hassan Reddick as a 3-4 rushing linebacker. And then you can have Josh Sweat on the other side standing up as a 3-4 rushing linebacker. As a 6'5 guy to be able to stand up and then just be able to like really get a head start and like get the angle on, on the tackle. And then in the middle, you have three competent middle linebackers. Even if one were to go down, you'd have two starters. And if you have all three guys healthy, you can just always have the best two guys on the field um, when you're running a 3-4. And if one guy's gassed, you still have two very high-level middle linebackers. So it's – they're going to really be able to, to finally throw some very exotic looks as opposed to having this vanilla as base looking defense. That's what really makes me excited. Oh, absolutely. It's just, it's just, this defense is, like I said, I mean, how, how impactful will this defense be compared to, say, an 4 Eagles defense? Will it be close to just as impactful or more impactful? I can't say more impactful because I don't know how much more impactful you can get that Dolphins there because Dolphins just brought a whole nother energy to that fucking Eagles team. So how close do you think this Eagles defense can get to that kind of Dolphins defense? I think that – if they have a solid year this year, I think within two years' time, they can be to that level. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I just think they're a couple of years away from that. I don't think it's there yet, but I think a couple that, more that, couple uh, that, we're good. Yeah. That first year with Andy Reid, remember all those guys, they, they were Ray Rose guys, right? Yeah. But yeah. They, they, they were just getting – they were within maybe their second or third year together. And mind you, you're going to a whole new defensive coordinator too. So you're going from Ray Rhodes to Jim Johnson, right? Mm -hmm. So different guy, different schemes. But within, I think, two years of being under Jim Johnson, 
they were dogs out there. So that 98 season and the 99 season, the 98 season, the last year with Ray Rose, the defense was was good. The team just sucked. And then the yeah. 99 season, the defense was had they were good and had potential, but they were almost like the Buccaneers were. The Buccaneers always had a good defense, but their their offense was so bad that they would lead their defense out there way too long. So it wasn't yeah. that the defense was bad, it's that the offense was just uh a liability. Yeah. So that second year under Jim Johnson in 2000, that's when you really saw that defense start to be hard body. Um, Dawkins, mm-hmm. Troy Vincent, Bobby Taylor, um, Jeremiah Dry, Jeremiah Trotter. Trotter got drafted in, in 98. So that second year, um, which was 2000, then you saw Trot as the the brains of that defense along with Dawkins. That's when you really started seeing them take off. So yeah. that's the timeline I envisioned for this Eagles defense if they stay healthy and keep relatively a similar core together under Jonathan Gannon. And then it's going to come down to, okay, you have the pieces now. Are you actually the guy at D coordinator or is it somebody else? Mm-hmm. We, we shall, we shall find out. Yeah. That's a big question mark for me as well as Gannon. Yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll see this next week, um, how training camp looks, you know, going through this, this second week and then into uh, Friday's game against the Jets. Um, we'll get our first look at these Eagles. And then uh, last but not least, I'm going out to Vegas this week and I will be attending the Raiders home game against the Minnesota Vikings at Allegiant Stadium on Sunday. So I'll be getting some footage and firsthand uh, exposure to what Derek Carr is going to look like with Darren Waller and hopefully Devontae Adams out there for a drive or two and see what this Raiders offense looks like because that's that's another team that addressed their core issues. They said, upgrade the wide receiver position. Let's just go out and get one of the best, if not the best receiver in football. And then on defense, just like we brought in Hassan Reddick, we go out and get Chandler Jones to match with uh, Max Crosby. So we all we went we went from having an anemic pass rush to having two one of the best duos in football potentially. Yeah, yeah, man, it's it's literally insane, man. Like, I mean, we we should be happy we're in this division because the Cowboys they've somewhat maintain the status quo while regressing slightly. You know, they lost Mari Cooper. They lost Randy Gregory. They lost uh, oh, Connor Connor Williams. Yeah. Yeah. So he lost quite a few pieces. But conversely, you look at the AFC West, going, you got Khalil Mack coming to the West. You got um, Russell Wilson going to the Broncos. You got, yeah, like I said, Khalil, Khalil Mack going to the Chargers and joining that offense with Herbert. And then um, even though they lost Tyree Kill, I mean, the Chiefs are still the Chiefs. So all the rest of the teams have gotten better along with us. So it wasn't just us getting better and closing the gap between the Chiefs. Everybody else got better, man. So it's like. It's going to be very. Comp- it's going to be one of the most. It's probably the most in the AFC side. That's the most competitive division on the AFC side. I don't know about in football, but I mean, it's pretty damn close. But. That, okay. That's a competitive as fuck. The West is, in my opinion, the most competitive division in both the AFC and the NFC. NFC, yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, definitely, for, yeah, I can definitely see it because Russell Rand, Wilson. Rand, well, <laughs> AFC West, you know, Russell Wilson with the Broncos, Justin Herbert with with the Chargers, um, D. Carr with Devontae Adams, and now you have you still have Pat Mahomes and that machine out there, and then you look at the NFC West. Super Bowl champion Rams who have added to their roster. You have the 49ers. I know it's the Trey Lance show right now, but that defense under D'Amico Ryans is for real. And then you have um uh what are the other two teams in the NFC West? Oh, the Cardinals. Cardinals. You know, Kyle Murray. He, yeah. he won't get his stuff together. They they're a problem, man. Him and DeAndre Hopkins. Like, come on, bro. Um, that that whole division, like the top three teams in the NFC West and in all four teams in the AFC West, they're just, they're top heavy in both divisions. Oh, for sure, man. So to me, those are the two divisions. They just all out West. It's wild, wild West right now. AFC, NFC don't matter. That's where it's at. Yeah, for sure. So fortunately we don't play in that division. So I think we're going to win it over the Cowboys because the commanders, they'll be, they'll be solid, but they're not going to win it. 
And nah. then the Giants, they're just uh, – they're rebuilding. I heard Carson Wentz has not been having a good camp. Same. So I can't wait to face him two times. Can't, <laughs> can't wait. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. All about the Wentz wagon. Ty. Not yeah. anymore. Nope. So, yeah, I mean, that's that's what's going on right now. But um, that's it for this episode. Leave your comments below. Like the video. And let me know what you guys' thoughts are, man. I love the engagement on the Facebook Live. Uh, make sure you leave comments on this. Let us know what you think about the Eagles' chances to win a division, what you think about Jalen Hurts and his potential moving forward into this uh, contract year. What do you think about the upgrades on offense? What do you think about the upgrades on defense? And what do you think about Nick Sirianni and how he's going to bring all this together along with – uh? Josh, uh, John Gannon. And ironically, I will be wearing my Rich Gannon jersey out to the Raiders game on Sunday. Um, that's it for this episode. I'm your coach, Jen. This is my co-host, Ryan. And we'll holler at y'all later. Peace. Peace.